chapter 5 is where we are this morning. Revelation chapter 5. If you have trouble finding Revelation, it's right before the maps. So look there. Revelation. We've been going through the book of Revelation. We're going to go through the entire book of Revelation. But right now, we are in chapter 5. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 of the book of Revelation are literally a picture, a window into heaven. The throne of heaven is, the, the, the throne room of heaven is opened for us and we get to peek in through this vision that God gave to the Apostle John. And so if you wonder, what is heaven like? What is heaven going to be like? Listen, chapter 4 and chapter 5 of the book of Revelation give us this picture. And I need y'all... Why? I don't want y'all bothering me when I'm up there. <laughs> Brother Mike, what's next? Who are these people? I'm going to be like, Le you should have paid attention. You went to the lake that Sunday. You should have been in church. I, you know, I'll tell you. Because uh, my job is to get you there. Once you were there, you're on your own. All right, friends? <laughs> Who are those people? It's the elders, I told you. Chapter 5 of the book of Revelation. It's going to tell us about heaven again. And so in chapter 4, you had the throne and one seated on the throne in heaven. It's absolutely God the Father. There's no question, no debate about that. And so from chapter 4 to chapter 5, there's a, there's a chapter division, but you don't really need a chapter division. And, and let me remind you, those chapter division and the verse numbers and the chapters, we added that as people later on, just to help us study and reference parts of the Bible, okay? So uh, those aren't divinely inspired. So there's really no need for a chapter division other than the focus changes from chapter 4 to chapter 5. In chapter 4, you see worship of God the Father who is the Creator. He created all things and sustains them according to His will. In chapter 5, the focus changes from worship of God the Creator, the, the Father, to worship of Christ the Redeemer. And that's the picture we see here in heaven happening. You know, the, the word heaven is used 532 times in the Bible. You think it's a major theme? Absolutely. Here it is, chapter 5, verse 1. We'll read just a little bit, and then we'll stop. It says... Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on a, a, the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even look at it. So take a quick break right there and let me get set the stage here. Let me give you the picture. You have that one seated at the throne, God the Father, who is being worshipped continually. And it says that, that one, the one at the throne, God the Father, in his right hand was a scroll. And if in your mind you picture, you know, some kind of ancient tomb where they unearth some scrolls, that's good. It's a scroll, and that scroll is sealed with seven different seals. And then there's a mighty angel that says, who's worthy? Who can open this scroll? It's a very important scroll, as we'll see in just a moment. This one that all of heaven is looking to and worshiping, seated at the throne in heaven, has in his hand a message, a scroll, and it's sealed seven times. It's a very important piece of paper or parchment. This angel says, who's worthy? Who can open it? But listen to verse 3. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to read it or even look in it. And so this royal decree in the hand of God the Father, very, very important, 
Nobody, it says, in heaven. Now think about who's in heaven. You've got the 24 elders right there in their own little mini thrones all around the throne of God. We saw that last week. You've got these terrifying living creatures who if we saw, we'd probably be so frightened. We, we couldn't even uh, utter any words or speak at all. We'd be so scared. And you have all the Old Testament saints. I mean, think about who's in heaven. You've got Moses in heaven. You've got Elijah and Elisha. You've got Isaiah, the prophet, Ezekiel. You've got all these incredible Old Testament saints. He says, none of them are worthy. You've also got in heaven all 12 of the apostles, including John, who's there on a vision. Not Judas, you know, we'll talk about that later. You've got the apostle Paul is in heaven right now. And he says, this angel says, the apostle Paul, unworthy to, to un." open the scroll and to read it. Incredible people. All of them are found to be unworthy. It says all people on in heaven. It says all people uh, on the earth. And it says people under the earth. So here's the conclusion. Nobody living or dead who has lived or who ever uh, will live or, or has lived or is living is worthy to open this scroll or to look into it. No one. No angel, as powerful as an angel is. And then he says, I wept bitterly. I wept and wept. This is a very important message that God the Father has for all of humankind. It affects the entire planet and nobody can read it. Nobody is worthy, it says. Let me tell you this too, that includes no Preacher is worthy. Think about Billy Graham. No politician is worthy, but we sure put a lot of our hopes in politicians, don't we? No college professor is worthy, although they seem to know everything about everything. No human being, no angel is worthy. There is only one who is worthy. And I'm going to harp on this for just a moment because you know what that means? That means that, that nobody can save you. Not even you are worthy. We need one who is worthy. John weeps. He says, he, he, says he, he says, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Look at it. No one. And listen, you think, well, John, settle down. It's a piece of paper. Why are you crying so much? By the way, can I just tell you one of my pet peeves? I hate when men use the word weep. Sounds so sissy. I? I don't know. I think using the words weep is more sissy than actually weeping. It's a side note. Just say cry. That's what, that's what I think. And John, John is emotional. John is upset. Because he understands what we will in just a moment. Really, really, as we get into chapter 6 and chapter 7 that this scroll is so crucial because it contains the cure for fixing everything that is wrong with the universe. You say, well, what's, what's wrong with the universe? Well, there's a uh, kind of a famous commentator named Donald Barnhouse. He once observed this. Four things that are out of place in the universe. The church, God's people, which should be in heaven... Israel, also God's people, which should be living in peace, occupying the land promised to her. Satan, who belongs in the lake of fire. And Christ, who should be seated on his throne, reigning. This scroll is going to make right what's gone wrong. God created the heavens and the earth, and he did so perfectly without sin. Man, in our wickedness, has corrupted all of God's perfect creation, but God is about to set it all straight. And that is contained within this scroll. And nobody can open it. Nobody is worthy to open it. And John, in heaven witnessing this, he says, no, we got we to gotta find somebody to open it. What are we going to do without this message we need this. It's from God. It's in, his, it's in his right hand, this important royal decree. 
what are we going to do? And he says, response is emotional. He gets upset. He cries. Verse 5, then one of the elders said, stop crying or do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. He says, says, look, stop crying. We found one in all of heaven, in all of earth, everybody who's ever lived, all the angels, all of God's creation, there's one that is worthy. And he calls him the lion of the tribe of Judah. Genesis chapter 49, Jacob is blessing his sons. And he refers to Judas as a staff. The scepter will never depart from Judah. He's called, it says the root of David or the root of Jesse. Isaiah chapter 11 talks about the shoot of, David, of Jesse, which will, which will shoot up and rule and reign and conquer. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the, the root of David. And then we got to, oh man, this is so good. I'm so excited. I got to calm down a little bit. <clears throat> so that's good news. So, so get this picture. The elder says, stop crying. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So, so then, verse 6, then I saw, so he looks, so he says, look, and then John looks, and what does he see? One like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of, of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. So this elder says, look, a lion. And when John turns, he sees a lamb. Now Jesus is uh, referred to as the lamb of God 31 times in the book of Revelation. It's a big theme in the book of Revelation. And it says he has seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God. So if you get kind of, whoa, that kind of sounds wonky. I've never seen a lamb uh, with seven horns. I've never seen a lamb with seven eyes. You'd be in the Guinness Book of World Records if you raised one like that, right? People would come from all over. Maybe the National Enquirer in line at the grocery store would picture something like this, but it's kind of outside of our imagination. These seven horns and the seven Eyes are representative of the, the Spirit of God, it says, the sevenfold Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Now think about that. The horns represent power and authority. That's what horns always mean. Animals that have horns have power and they have authority. Seven eyes, seven being the number of completion and perfection. That means the Holy Spirit of God sees everything. And it goes out into all the earth. Did you see that? The Holy Spirit of God, therefore, is all-powerful, all-seeing, and all-present. And so he says, look, a lion, but I saw a lamb. This is it, friends. I don't know if you uh, underline, if you got an app that you're reading your Bible on, you need to double tap this one. If you're reading in a, 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 a regular Bible, a real Bible like this, then you need to um, bracket it, underline it, maybe bust out the pink highlighter. You know what I mean? This is an important verse right here. And so he, he says, I saw one like a slaughtered lamb. I, he said, look, in verse 5, look, the lion. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb. Think about the, when, God, when Jesus is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah, Judah and the lamb of God, what does that say about him? Well, you know, if you think about a lion, uh, lions are strong. Lions are royalty. I mean, they're royal, the king of the jungle, right? That's not just a Disney movie. This is how lions are pictured. They are in charge of things out in the wilderness. They are dangerous. Lions are dangerous. You know that already. You know what lions eat? Whatever they want to eat. The lions in the jungle just roam around like it's the Golden Corral or the Furs Cafeteria. They eat whatever they want. I saw a video a while back of a, of a lion, and it had, it had found a, a baby warthog. Out, this is in Africa. People on safari, they're videoing it. And it's kind of loving on this baby warthog and playing with it and nuzzling it, nuzzling it with its nose, you know, and kind of this cute little thing. People are, ah, oh. you can hear them on the safari jeep. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, look at it playing. And then just out of nowhere, home. Lions are not snuggly. 
They're dangerous. They're fierce. They conquer whatever they want to conquer. And anything that comes against them, they fight it. Then you get the opposite end of the spectrum, the lamb. And you think about a lamb. A lamb is snuggly. A lamb is a pacifist. They, they will run away from danger. Lambs are soft. Lambs are not dangerous. No one has ever been afraid of a lamb. If, if, if you're afraid of a lamb, that means you're softer than lambs are. They're tender. They're gentle. They're safe. They're sacrificial. And let's, let, me, let, me, let me give you this observation. You know, a lamb can never become a lion. Right? Like, 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 a, like a lamb can't go to the gym and hit the bench press, eat some creatine, sharpen its teeth, and become a lion. It's always going to be a lamb. That's it. But a lion can become a lamb. A lion can humble itself. A lion can put on lamb's clothing. And this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus, the lion, becomes the lamb for us. And so when you read in the New Testament, the Gospels particularly, you hear about the lamb. You hear about the gentle, meek, tender heart of God, Jesus Christ, who, who set aside glory for a moment and put on humanity and was sacrificed for your sins and for my sins. And if you're not careful, you read those Gospels, you might start believing that Jesus is only the Lamb. But friends, He is also the Lion. He's the Lion who became the Lamb. Here in the book of Revelation, we're about to see the Lion. We're about to see Jesus in all power and authority and glory, and things are going to get fierce here in the book of Revelation. Now, did you, did you notice this lamb, how it's described? First, it says, Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing. Have you ever seen something that was slaughtered standing? No. Can you even imagine what that would look like? Maybe wounded, bloody? How could something that had been slaughtered be standing? The resurrection. The resurrection. This lamb was slaughtered for us and it came back from the dead. Jesus laid down his life. Sinful man thought they had conquered the lion but what they had done was sacrifice the lamb, but that lamb rose from the grave once and for all. And so this slaughtered lamb is the resurrected Messiah, Jesus. I read, somebody, say, somebody said one time, I read it, that in heaven, you will not see any of the works of man. It'll all be the works of God except for one thing. The only works of man you will see in heaven are the marks of we left on the lamb. This is the picture of our sacrificed, our slaughtered Messiah. And it says they all, they all bowed down. They all worshiped him. He, verse 7, when he went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne, the lamb took the scroll, the four, when the lamb took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and a golden bowl filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. And so uh, from the Greek context here, the ones holding the harp and the, one holding, the ones holding the bowl seem to be the 24 elders. So it says they, so likely the ones singing here are also the 24 elders. Remember I told you last week, the four living creatures I think are angelic if they are, uh, if they are angels, if they are singing, this will be the only time in scriptures angels sing. So what I think is happening is they're all falling down. They're all on their face, but it's the 24 elders. That is the church, representative of the church, holding harps and bowls, and they fall down. It says they sang a new song. 
It says, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a king and priest to our God and they will reign on earth. So they fall down, they worship him, they sing a new song. It says, Jesus, you're worthy because you were slaughtered. Why? To purchase people, humans, us, with your blood. It says, it said that salvation is free, and that is absolutely true, but it was not cheap. It's free to us, but it cost God the Father his son. The purchase price of our salvation was the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. And he said, you are worthy because with your sacrifice, you purchased people. And these people, by the way, are from every tribe and every language on earth. Now listen, this, this scene of, of people in heaven from every language group, from every tribe on earth, that ever that exists or has ever existed um, is something that has never taken place on earth. You know, we talk a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about diversity these days. Diversity, diversity, diversity. But heaven will be the most diverse place that has ever existed. People of every tribe will be there. Not just every country. Think about all the tribal groups in every country on earth. Every language group on earth will be there. You know, most of the world's population is at least bilingual. One language is, a, is kind of an American thing. That's the joke, right? What do you call somebody who tri- uh, has three languages? They're trilingual. What do you call somebody who's bilingual, uh, has two languages? Bilingual. What do you call somebody who only speaks one language? American. We only speak one language, but most of the earth speaks a lot of languages. If you go to India, I knew people in seminary that were from India and from the Middle East and things, and they might speak six or seven languages fluently. Almost all of Europe is at least bilingual. Think of all the languages there are on earth. A lot of times in Africa, a person might know a tribal language that is specific to just their very small tribe, and then a regional language, and then a national language. All the languages. And there'll be somebody, at least, from every single one of those language groups on planet Earth. Isn't that incredible? And they'll be gathered before the throne. And then it, sa- it says that, that um, let me continue. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands That's hundreds of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and everything in them say. So this is all of creation crying out in all of the world and everything that's existed, never has existed, never will exist, Blessing and honor, glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And so you have these doxologies, these, these songs, these psalms of worship of Jesus, the Lamb, the slaughtered Lamb, who is also the Lion. Every time you see people encountering Jesus in the Bible... When they realize who he is, this is the response. Worship. Worship. What happens in heaven? Worship. The New Testament saints, even when you think about the apostles who are called, they realize who he is and they say, like John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God. They fall at his feet and worship him. Worship is what takes place in heaven. And so that's why when we come here every Sunday morning, we get a little bitty taste of heaven. That's why church camp like Falls Creek is so good because you, you just worship Jesus all week, undistracted by everything else in the world. And it's a, it's a little taste of heaven. You see people worshiping Jesus when they encounter him. 
Jesus should inspire your worship. When people, in, people encounter Jesus, they worship him. So if you don't worship Jesus, then likely you've never encountered him. You guys were, uh, man, alive this morning during worship. We were singing, and I heard whoops and claps, and everybody just awake. Maybe the rain stopped. We're fired up this morning. I love it. Somebody might say, boy, that's, that first Baptist, they're awfully irrever- irreverent. And I would say, no, we're awfully joyful. There, there won't be just reverence in heaven. There'll be joy. You see them singing these songs? celebrating, excited. You ought to be excited. If you're not excited to worship Jesus, there's plenty of boring churches out there to go to. Come see me. I'll make some recommendations for you. But here we're going to sing. We're going to be excited. We're going to laugh. We're going to come to church and be encouraged, hopefully. Hopefully. Because we've got so much to celebrate. We've got the Lion of the tribe of Judah who became the Lamb of God, was slaughtered for our sins and purchased our salvation, paid for all of our sins. He could do that because he is the sinless Son of God. He never sinned. That's why he's worthy. He's never sinned. And also, he's God's Son. And also, he was willing to die. For all those reasons, we should... Come to church on Sunday. We should be excited about it, and we should come and worship him. And when we do that, we're just practicing for eternity. We're going to do this forever. So if you don't like church, you're going to hate heaven if you're there. We're going to worship the one who is worthy of our worship. The one who purchased our salvation forever. 10,000 years, well, we just have begun worshiping Jesus. Whatever else is there, I mean, you see the mansions for the first time, you see the streets of gold and all the gems and all this stuff that's mentioned, that'll be cool. You'll, You'll say, wow. But imagine, friends, oh, imagine the first time you see this lamb. Imagine the very first time that you put your eyes on Jesus for the first time. That'll make it all worth it. Whatever you have to go through here on earth to worship Jesus, it'll make it all worth it. Any persecution, any ridicule you might experience for worshiping Jesus, it'll make it all worth it the very first moment you're in heaven and see Jesus. The very first moment. That he was slaughtered to purchase people by his blood. Listen, I want to tell you this. You are unworthy to purchase yourself. You can't do it. And nobody else, by the way, can purchase your salvation for you other than Jesus. So that means, well, hey, um, grandma used to pray a whole bunch. She prayed for me a whole bunch. Well, praise God for a godly grandma, but she can't save you. Not even grandma's worthy. Only the lamb is worthy. The lion of the tribe of Judah. So if you're trying to be good enough on your own, you'll never make it. If you think you can balance out good and bad in your life, do a little bit of extra good to to make up for the things you've done wrong, you'll never do enough good. You are unworthy to purchase your salvation. And, And even by your blood, even if you shed your blood to do so, Your blood is unworthy because it's stained with sin. Only Jesus has the perfect blood of God, untainted, unsoiled by sin. And he was willing to spill it on a cruel, terrible cross to purchase your salvation. To purchase you so that you could be there in heaven Worshiping Jesus forever. And not just that, we get to worship him here together on earth until we get there in heaven. 
But for some people, for some people, the very first moment they see Jesus will not be a happy time. For some people, they will get a glimpse into heaven just long enough to know what they're missing out on. It's people who, though Jesus died for them, have never surrendered their life to him, have never received a gift that's already been given. They've never taken the payment that's already been made for their salvation, for their sins. They've never been saved. So I think they'll stand in heaven for a moment before God and they'll see all of the grandeur and all of the beauty and they'll see that lamb that died for them whom they rejected. It'll be just long enough to say, oh no, oh man, oh man. And they'll be sent off to hell, the lake of fire, the, the, the Bible calls it, and we'll see that in Revelation, forever. Forever and ever. But this is not the way God wants it to be. Listen to me today, friends. If you're here, if you're listening to me, if you're on Facebook Live listening to me, listen, God wants you in heaven. I, I believe it with all my heart. I wouldn't stand up here and say something I believe to be false about God. I have enough reverence and respect for him not to do that. Listen, I firmly believe God wants you in heaven. I believe it so much because he sent his son Jesus to die to purchase your ticket to heaven. He wants you there. Jesus wants you there. Think about the Lord's Prayer. He says, your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus wants you to worship him now on earth, to surrender your life to him, to give him control now, worship him now, and then worship him all throughout eternity. That's what it means to be a believer, a follower of Jesus. And we will be here for this moment one day. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you stepped out of this life that you're living right now, how certain are you that you would be ushered into heaven according to what you've done with this sacrifice? Have you received it? Have you taken it? Have you submitted to God by faith and been saved? If not, listen, listen. A terrible fate awaits you in eternity. And I don't want you to go there. And God doesn't want you to go there. And Jesus doesn't want you to go there. The lamb was slain for you. Would you be saved? Embrace that gift of salvation today. Would you bow your heads? Everyone in this room, all across the room, would you take a moment and bow your head? Close your eyes. <clears throat> And just focus for a second. Focus for a minute in your mind on that slaughtered lamb. That slaughtered lamb that was slaughtered for you. A lion who didn't have to become a lamb, but did so, submitted itself humbly so that it could be slaughtered and sacrificed for you. The moment you see that lamb in heaven, the day you die, what will your first thought be? I hope, listen, I hope, if you can hear me today, I hope it's not regret. I hope it's not Man, I wish, oh man, I was wrong. I wish, I wish I'd just gotten saved. I wish I would just give my life. I don't know why I fought it. My, all my excuses seem so foolish now. Oh no, what have I done? I hope the first thought is for you. 
That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. I, he gave his life for me. I gave my life to him, and I worshiped him on earth, and I'm going to worship him forever. That is my Jesus. If you need to give your heart and your life to Jesus today, I want you to pray right where you're at this morning. If you're listening online or on the radio, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, stop. Focus on God for a minute. This is the most important thing a person could do. Just pray. Call out to God by faith. Pray. Give your life to Him. Accept His payment for your sins. Ask Him into your heart. And then commit your life to Him. If you've not given your life to the Lamb, do so right now. Do so right now. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find rest. And without you, I fall apart. in just a moment, we're going to stand. And as, as we stand in just a moment, if you're here today and you have prayed and asked Jesus into your heart or you need to, I want you to come. I want you to come talk to me or Logan or Tracy, he'll be down here with me. And if you need help, if, if you've got a question that you need answered, we want to help you with that decision today to follow Jesus. If you've prayed where you're sitting today and you've asked Jesus into your heart, for the very first time or, or you've meant it for the very first time, I want you to come when we stand. You come and make that public today and we'll get your baptism scheduled and we'll start helping you walking with Jesus, worshiping Jesus in your life. Maybe you've been putting off a decision you need to make for God. Maybe that's joining our church, becoming a member of First Baptist Church. God has brought you here. He wants you to be involved he wants you to be plugged in. You need to put down roots and make it official. If he's laid that on your heart. I want you to come here in just a moment when we stand. All right, let's stand this morning. We'll stand and we'll begin to sing. And you come. When sin runs deep, your grace is more. Your grace is found.
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. We get to uh, witness uh, two baptisms today we're so excited about. First of all is Max Zapata. And Max uh, came forward a few weeks ago. He and I had been chatting about um, his desire, he and his wife, to join our church and become members here. He grew up in a different faith tradition that, uh, that don't baptize as believers. And so we talked about that. He prayed about that. For a few weeks and made his own decision to be baptized and join First Baptist Church, and we're very excited about that. Aren't we, church? Aren't we, church? <clears throat> Absolutely. Max, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Yes. Upon that profession of faith in Jesus Christ, who is now your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. Next is Keturah Hoggett. Keturah also made a profession of faith in Jesus uh, earlier on in life, but just was never able to be baptized, never had the opportunity to follow through in baptism. Uh, she had indicated a desire to join our church, become a member here at First Baptist, and I told her that included baptism, and she's here today to do that. Katura, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Yes. Upon that profession of faith, in Jesus Christ, who is now your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk... In the newness of life. Amen. There you go. There you go. Praise the Lord. I believe we have one decision this morning. Would you stand up, Logan? Go ahead. All right. This is my friend Reagan Martin. Reagan called me yesterday. We've never met before. She gave me a call. We have a mutual friend. And uh, she's actually looking for a job. That's why she called. And we just got to talking. And I invited her to church. And guess what? She woke up and came to church this morning. Amen? Amen. We sat back there, and and Michael gave that invitation. And I said, Reagan, have you ever made a decision like that before? And she said, no. I said, would you like to today? And she said, yes, sir, please. And so here we are today, standing in front of you evidence of God changing a life and we're so thankful Reagan that you came to church with us this morning that not only you came but you gave your life to Jesus today we're so thankful for that praise the Lord praise the Lord that is great great news and uh, we've had many decisions at Falls Creek this week we'll be doing some more baptisms coming up 
for some of those students that have made Jesus their Lord and Savior. So stay tuned. We're excited as we begin summer uh, on a great note. Let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Before I do, don't forget our gentlemen are at the back with the offering baskets to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Uh, Vacation Bible School is in your church bulletin. The date's on that. Mark that down in your calendar so you can be sure and be there for that. Also, Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights, we have our adult Bible study over here with supper at 530, and then we have Bible study at 6. And then over here in our kids' area, we have Wednesday night kids' club for ages uh, kindergarten through 6th grade. And that just started last week. And so join us for that for all of our young people there. And then our 7th through 12th graders are in the youth room back here for Wednesday night Bible study. So we're excited about that. Let me pray and I'll close this in prayer. You'll, You'll be dismissed. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lion of the tribe of Judah for becoming the Lamb of God that saved us from our sins. You laid down your life for us. God, thank you. Lord, thank you. For those that we've seen in recent days, follow through with commitments. Follow to to receive you as their Lord and Savior or to be baptized or to join our church as members. Whatever the decision might be, we're thankful that your Holy Spirit is moving and stirring and drawing people unto yourself. God, please continue to do that here at First Baptist Church. God, I pray for each one that's here today and those uh, uh, watching online. Father, I pray you'd speak loudly. And clearly to our hearts through your word that we've heard today, convict us of areas of sin. Encourage us and strengthen us with your word. We love you and pray this in your wonderful name. Amen.